Hi, my name is Julia Pinnix. I work for Leavenworth Fisheries Complex in Leavenworth, Washington State. Welcome to the macro invertebrate lesson for kids in the creek. This video is designed for high school level learning. Be sure you have some paper and a pen or pencil. You can also download the worksheet from the Kids in the Creek website. Entiat National Fish Hatchery is the host site for Kids in the Creek. We're going to take a virtual visit to the hatchery and see what kinds of macroinvertebrates we can find in two different locations, the wetland and the river. Here's the point. We're going to see whether we can make some predictions about the water quality of both a wetland and a river based on what we find living there. Macroinvertebrate is a hefty word, but it's easy to break down. What does macro mean? Take a moment and write down your answer. You can pause the video while you do that. So what does macro mean? Big, big enough to see without a microscope. What do you think micro means? <laughs> if you guessed the opposite of macro, you're right. Micro is small, macro is big. Next question, what is a vertebrate? Take a moment and write down your answer. You can pause the video while you do that. So what is a vertebrate? An animal with a backbone, also called a spine. So that makes an invertebrate what? If you guessed an animal without a backbone, you're right. Vertebrates have spines. Invertebrates do not. The invertebrates we'll be looking at are aquatic. So where do they live? If you guessed in the water, you're right. Macroinvertebrates are an important food source for fish. They hide under rocks or in cases they build or camouflage themselves so they're hard to see. Fly fishermen use lures made to look like the macroinvertebrates fish like to eat. So learning about macroinvertebrates can make you a better angler. Now for an introduction to our site. The hatchery at Entiat currently raises 400,000 summer Chinook salmon every year. The water available for the hatchery to use comes from a spring, from wells around our site, and from the Entiat River. The water first runs through the raceways that hold the young salmon. A raceway is a long rectangular tank that has water coming in at one end and going out at the other end. Once the water goes through the raceways, it is pumped up to a trout pond. Then the water goes into a manufactured wetland. The wetland was built to recycle nutrients from fish poop out of the water, and now also helps hold water on the site and recharge the wells. This is a look at the wetland. This is a look at the river. There are a few factors that can affect water quality. Extra nitrogen and phosphorus that comes from fish poop, lower dissolved oxygen, and warmer water temperature. These can all be termed pollution. So what do you think the water quality of the water in the wetland might be after passing through 400,000 young salmon and a pond full of rainbow trout? Good, okay, or bad? Take a moment to write down your guess.
So what about the Entiat River? What do you think the water quality there might be? Better, the same, or worse than the wetland? Take a moment to write down your guess. One way we can check to see what the water quality might be is to look at aquatic macroinvertebrates. They live in the water all or most of their lives. Some are tolerant of pollution and some are not. What does tolerant mean? Take a moment to write down your answer. You can pause the video while you think. Tolerant means you can live with something. You can accept it. You might be tolerant of your barking dog or tolerant of spicy food. Tolerant in our lesson is another way of saying an animal can survive some pollution. It can accept worse conditions. How about intolerant? What does that mean? Take a moment to write down your answer. Intolerant means you can't stand it. You can't live with it. It makes you sick. For example, you might have asthma and that makes you intolerant of smoky air. Intolerant is also another way of saying an animal cannot survive poor water quality. It's too hot or it's too low in oxygen or it has too much nitrogen or it's too acidic, for instance. Here's what we're going to do now. We're going to ask you to view a series of videos of different aquatic macroinvertebrates filmed in Entiat National Fish Hatchery's wetland and in the nearby Entiat River. For each video, try to identify the macroinvertebrate by name and determine whether it is tolerant or intolerant. I'll show you how this works. If you downloaded the worksheet, it has links to online keys for identification that are very helpful. It also has some keys attached. If you don't have the worksheet, I'm going to post the websites for you now. You can pause the video and write them down so that you can find them on your own. Okay, I'm going to identify a macroinvertebrate for you now using the keys. First, we're going to watch this video. Okay, so this macroinvertebrate was collected under a rock at the end of the edge of the Indiat River. Good to know. So it looks like we're looking at the head. I see eyes and I see a, a pair of kind of small downward facing antennae. It's got kind of a large body. It looks like three tail filaments hanging off the end, uh, long skinny tail parts. Those are some kind of beefy shoulders. I'm seeing one, two, three pairs of legs, and that pulsing that we're seeing, those are the gills. So that's how this animal is breathing, and that's on the abdomen. So I remember on insects, we have the head, thorax, abdomen. You're looking at the abdomen right now and the gills that are pulsing on it, and there's those three tail parts we can see again. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate how to use this one sheet simple key to see if I can find the animal we were just watching. We're going to start with this first key. This is a key to macroinvertebrate life in the river. We're going to start with this key and see if we can identify the organism that we were just looking at. So our first choice is shells or no shells and this animal did not have shells. So our next choice is legs or no legs. We definitely had legs, so we're gonna drop down to this section. We have three choices here, 10 or more legs, four pairs of legs, that's a total of eight, or three pairs of legs, total of six. Well, I saw three pairs of legs. So our next choice is no wings, or wings. I did not see any wings on this organism, so we're going to take the no wings option. Now we have three choices again. No obvious tails, one or two tails, or three tails. Well, I saw three tails, and here are our options. We have mayfly, three different types of mayfly, and one kind of damselfly. The one I think it looks most like is this one right here. 
a mayfly larva. Now let's try going to one of the online keys and try identifying the animal there. We can see if we get the same answer or a different answer. Now we'll try doing the same thing, but with a different key. This one here, we have several different choices and they kind of pop at you as you hover over them. So we're looking at beetles, true flies, true bugs, dragonflies and damselflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, alderflies, dobsonflies, fishflies, butterflies and moths, and mayflies. Now based on the organism that we were looking at, it had three tails. I'm seeing three tails on a lot of these, and I'm seeing three tails on a lot of these. But when I look at the animal itself, it didn't quite look like these. It looked to me a little bit more like maybe one of these. So let's go ahead and click on that and see where it takes us. Now it gives us a whole bunch of different choices. None of these look quite right to me. Neither of these look quite right to me. Now I think we're in the right category here. And in fact, there's five different types we can look at. It looked a lot like this one to me. It had these odd things along the side. And this, if you click on these, it gives you more details. So let's say I want to click on that. It's going to show me an up close version and it's going to tell me what it is. So it's gills on the abdomen. I can close this and look again here. Uh, and then I can go back to this main picture if I want to. I can either blow it up or not. And I can also see the belly side if I want. But our view was only dorsal. It was only the back side. So that's what I'm going to stick with. Well, I'm going to go back a step here and just click through this and double check these out. Could be something maybe like this, but ours wasn't so dark. Let's just keep scanning down the page and see if there's anything else that looks like it. Didn't look like that to me. Kind of looked like this one, perhaps. Didn't look like these to me, although kind of like this one. Didn't look like these. Didn't look like these. Kind of looked like that, but this has more stuff sticking out, I think. And now we're down to the bottom. So I'm going to go back up to that category where I thought it was most likely. Where was that? I think it was here. I was looking at this one. I'm going to click on that. It shows, let's see, these also correspond with things that we can investigate. Segment two without gills. What does that mean? This is the only mayfly family with gills absent on abdominal segment two, one, two. So if we go back and look, do we see gills on this section or not? I think that we did not see gills on that abdominal section. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable about this decision here. Uh, I'm just going to fool around with some of these buttons. There we go. And if you remember the head, it had two little antennae like this. I'd say this is a pretty good choice. And I don't want to take a whole lot of time continuing to look even closer. I'm going to say this one. And I can put down Ephemeroptera, Ephemerellidae. I can put down the genus name up here. It's one of these. Uh, so I have a number of different options that I can exercise on this one. Let's just go back here. Yeah, this is the one I feel most comfortable with. So let's go with this. So let's take a look at a different key. This one is also a pretty straightforward, simple key. It's using drawings in this case, and it helps you out with some of the vocabulary if that's useful to you. So we come to the first page. I'm just scrolling down. Um, to get to this. And it asks, does it have jointed legs or does it not have jointed legs? I saw, yes, jointed legs. So our next choice is, did it have 10 or more or did it have six? And I'd say it has six. So I'm going to click on this and it's going to take me down here. Now I have another choice. If it has jointed legs, did it have a case 
or did it not have a portable case, a thing that it's living inside of? I did not see a portable case. So now it's asking, did it have no observable wings or wing pads, or did it have wing pads or wings? I didn't see any wings, so I'm going to drop down here. But these organisms just don't look right, so I must have missed something. So the easy way to do this is you just scroll right back up to where you were. Um, so here we are, and let's say, okay, that there were wing pads or wings present. Maybe there were wing pads. Uh, so wing pads means it's a little piece of its anatomy that indicates that eventually wings are going to grow on the adult. Here's a clip from our video. I'm looking at the back of this mayfly, but boy, I just really don't see any wing pads. In this photo, which is taken from the key, where we identified this as a mayfly, you can see the wing pads. They're pretty subtle, but you can just make out the shape of the wing pads on the back. It's no wonder we couldn't see it in the video, which wasn't nearly as good a photograph as this one. So I'm going to say, let's try this one instead. So did it have tail filaments or no tail filaments? Well, we saw three tail filaments, so we're going to go here. And it gives us three different choices. We've got stoneflies, they've only got two tail filaments and no abdominal gills. We have the mayflies that have two or three tail filaments and they do have abdominal gills. And we have three flat tail filaments, no abdominal gills and a large hinged mouth. Well, we didn't have flat filaments. They were all kind of, uh, they weren't flattened. They were tube-like. And it did have abdominal gills, we saw them. So it's gotta be a mayfly. And there we are. Now let's take a look at this one. Uh, this is a key to macroinvertebrate life in ponds and rivers in Utah, but it's still very accurate for our area. And we have our two choices here. My organism has a shell or it does not have a shell. It did not have a shell. So we're going to click on that. Our next choice, my organism has no legs. My organism has legs. Well, it definitely had legs, right? So I'm going to click on that one. Now it gives me some choices. Does it have 10 or more legs? Does it have four pairs of legs? Or does it have three pairs of legs? And what I saw was three pairs of legs. So we're going to click that. Then we'll scroll down again. My organism has wings, has no wings. Again, I, I didn't see wings. So we're going to say no wings. So now it's asking us no tails, one or two tails, or three tails. We saw three tails. So I'm going to click on that one. And now it says, does it have well-defined abdominal gills or flat tail filaments with no abdominal gills? Well, they weren't flat. They were more thread-like, and it definitely had abdominal gills. So we'll click on that one. And now it gives us some choice. One of these, or maybe this one, or that one. How about that one? Now, this is looking a lot more like it, right? Kind of robust, big beefy legs, got the, has the gills down here, it has the three tails. Then there's these. These guys, looks like they're mostly head. This weird looking thing, that one. And it didn't have all this stuff around its head. And it was beefier than that. Look kind of like this, but it didn't have all the hairy stuff on its own, on its gills. So let's go back up to this one, which I think is our most likely one. And you can click on it and get a closer view of it. You can go back to get the name. So Ephemeralidae spiny mayflies. Now you don't have to use all of these keys to identify each and every macroinvertebrate. Use the one that you like best. Uh, if you're not finding what you're looking for on the first one, try a different one. But don't feel obligated to use every one of these keys like we just did. This was just an example of the different keys that you can use. In addition to trying to find a name for each macroinvertebrate, you also need to figure out which ones are tolerant or intolerant of pollution. There are two keys for that as well. Here's the first one. All right, now we're looking at whether our organism is tolerant or intolerant. And this is the first key we're going to examine. So we're looking at the mayfly nymphs here. We know we have a mayfly and it's listed under intolerant. So that means this animal cannot tolerate pollution. Now, if we look down here, just to be sure, if we had misidentified it as a damselfly, 
damselfly is tolerant, and that gives us a really different result, doesn't it? So you want to be sure that you're accurate in your identification so you get the right result. Now let's go to our next key. This one is a little bit more um, gray area. There's very intolerant, moderately intolerant, fairly tolerant, very tolerant. Uh, and in this one, a little bit different. This has some of the adults on it, which is really useful because some of our videos are going to show you adults and you might be able to spot your adult in here. And even with that, you should be able to tell tolerance versus intolerance. So with the organism we just looked at, it was a mayfly nymph, right? Very intolerant of pollution. Absolutely cannot tolerate any kind of pollution. That's a really useful thing to know about mayflies. If you can't find an answer for tolerance or intolerance on these keys, try doing some online research. If you still can't find an answer, then write down unknown for this animal. This is an important part of what you're learning, so don't skip doing this. All right, now it's your turn. Watch each video, do your best to identify the animal, and try to figure out whether it is tolerant or intolerant of pollution. Good luck.
Okay, before we check to see how you did on your identification, let's take a look at the answers you got for tolerance versus intolerance. For the animals you identified in the wetland or river environment, how many are tolerant of pollution and how many are intolerant? Tally it up for each of the different environments, for the wetland and for the river. You can pause the video to do this now. If you're finding a lot of organisms that are tolerant of pollution, does that mean the water is still fine for fish like salmon? It turns out salmon and other fish are very sensitive to certain kinds of pollution. If you're finding a lot of tolerant macroinvertebrates, you should be worried about the fish that share that water. On the other hand, tolerant organisms can be found even in very clean, unpolluted water. They can live in a wide range of conditions. But if you are finding organisms that are intolerant of pollution, that tells you the water can't be polluted or they would not survive there. Finding intolerant macroinvertebrates in the water is a very good sign that fish can also thrive there. Now take a moment to fill out the analysis section of the worksheet. Here's what that looks like. There are three sections. The first is your claim. Is the wetland healthy or polluted? Is the river healthy or polluted? The second row asks what evidence you used to make your claim. What did you use to help decide whether the wetland and river are healthy or polluted? Now the third row asks how your evidence supports your claim. Explain your reasoning. Show how you made your decision. Take some time to answer these questions. You can pause the video while you do this. Look back to the guesses you made at the beginning of this lesson. I asked you to guess whether the water quality in the wetland is good, okay, or bad. And I asked you to guess whether the water quality of the river was better, the same, or worse than the wetland. How do your guesses at the beginning compare with your answers now? Okay, now let's see how you did on your identification. We're gonna go over each of the organisms and its multiple names. For almost all of these organisms, you may find more than one name for them in your identification. I'm gonna list all the possible names that I would consider to be correct. So for number one, the mayfly, ephemeropterid, ephemerella, or spiny crawler mayfly. For number two, flatworm, planaria, fluke, or platyhelminthid. Number three, amphipod, side swimmer, or scud. Number four, pond snail, lunged snail, pouch snail, left-handed pond snail, or gastropod. Number five, Alder fly or Cialis. Number six, a cased caddisfly. Number seven, a cased caddisfly. Number eight, midge larva or chironomid. Number nine, net spinning caddisfly, net spinner or arctopsyche. Number 10, net spinning caddisfly, common net spinner, or hydrocycid. Number 11, water boatman, or Hesperocorexa. Number 12, damselfly, or odonata. Number 13, dragonfly, darner dragonfly, Odonata, Aeschinida, Spotted Darner, or Boyeria. Number 14, Stonefly, Plecopterid, Common Stonefly, Agnetina, or Golden Stonefly. Number 15, American Salmonfly. 
Number 16. Renatra, or Water Scorpion. Number 17. Rat-tailed Maggot, Hoverfly, Flowerfly, Syrphida, or Chrysogaster. Number 18. Giant Water Bug, Bellostoma, or Toe Biter. Number 19. Mite, Water Mite, or Hydrachnid. There are three questions left, and these are thought questions. I'm not going to answer them for you. If you have the worksheet, they're in the last section called Conclusions and Considerations. I'm going to show these questions on the screen so you can write them down and think about them. But before I put those up on the screen, I want to say thank you for joining me on this lesson. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at some of the macroinvertebrates that live at Entiat National Fish Hatchery. Aquatic macroinvertebrates are used for measuring water quality by professionals in the field. This was not just a fun exercise for students, it's really something natural resource professionals use in their work. Now I'll post those final thought questions for you. At the end, you'll also see some contact information if you have questions or comments. Thanks.